Samuel 28, verses 1 through 14. In those days, the Philistines gathered the forces for war to fight against Israel. Achish said to David, you know, of course, that you and your men are to go out with me in the army. David said to Achish, very well, then you shall know what your servant can do. Achish said to David, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Saul consults a medium. Now Samuel had died and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. Saul had expelled the mediums and the wizards from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem. Saul gathered all Israel and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, not by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, seek out for me a woman who is a medium so that I may go to her and inquire of her. His servant said to him, there is a medium at, at Endor, Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes and went there, he and two men with him. They came to the woman by night and he said, consult a spirit for me and bring up for me the one whom I named to you. The woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done and he, how he has cut off mediums and the wizards from the land. Why then are you laying a snare for my life to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring for you? He answered, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul, the king said to her. Have no fear. What do you see? The woman said to Saul, I see a divine being coming up out of the ground. He said to her, What is his appearance? She said, an old man is coming up. He is wrapped in a robe. So Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed with his face to the ground and did obeisance. The word of the Lord. Starting to get interesting, this story, isn't it? In fact, I just can't resist. I'm going to read a little more. Would you pray with me? The Spirit of God, we have these long and beautiful stories in our scriptures and don't often get a chance to reflect on them. So we'd ask that you would open our hearts and minds as we take up this particular part of your scriptures. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So after Saul bowed down on the ground when he realized Samuel's spirit was present. Samuel then said to Saul, why have you disturbed me and brought me up? And Saul answered, I'm in trouble. The Philistines are attacking me and God's turned away from me, no longer answers me, not even by the prophets or in dreams. So I've called on you to tell me what to do. And Samuel said, well, why do you ask me? Seeing that the Lord has turned away from you and has become your adversary, the Lord has done for himself as he foretold through me. The Lord has torn the kingship out of your hands and given it to your fellow, your neighbor, David, because you did not obey the Lord and did not execute his wrath upon the Amalekites. That is why the Lord has done this to you this day. 
Further, the Lord will deliver the Israelites who are with you into the hand of the Philistines. Tomorrow your sons and you will be with me. And the Lord will also deliver the Israelite forces into the hands of the Philistines. And at once, Saul flung himself prone on the ground, terrified by Samuel's words. Besides, there was no strength in him, for he had not eaten anything all day and all night. The grass withers in the flower, fades, but the word of our God stands forever. It's positively Shakespearean. You know, the story at a certain point, it's got an immense amount of drama. You got this king, right? And the fate of the nation is in his hands. And he's desperate and worried and concerned. He's been in conflict with a neighbor tribe for a long time. This battle he's had with David going on, a battle that David wanted to avoid if he possibly could. And so here he is battling with a guy who's a shepherd with great aim, wonderful poetic words in his heart, somehow the ability to draw people together. He's a political genius, that David. And Paul, that's all at this moment, is facing the Philistine army. Now, the thing about the Philistines is they were more advanced. They were a larger nation than was Israel. In fact, Israel really, really wasn't quite a nation yet at all. And the Philistines also had superior weaponry. Where have we heard this? And so he's overwhelmed and scared to death, wondering what to do. And what happens? He goes to a medium, he's so desperate. And the medium conjures up Samuel, the very epitome of the old way Israel used to do things. You know, they used to gather together to tribes when somebody would come and attack them. They'd gather them together and you'd have a prophet that would, and a judge that would hold everything together and get the people to be going in one direction and push away the adversary. The very epitome, but that time is done. Samuel says, you're done. There's no wonder that God is not talking to you anymore. It, things are changing. Samuel has nothing to offer. Saul has nothing left to give. And so he's desperate. So what are we to make of this? What do we make of a tale like this? Well, you know, the story was told really to try and explain to us or give insight to us on how God works in history. Well, just the way things move as as the creator draws the chain of cause and effect towards the creator's perfect purpose. There's a fast changing world. It was changing fast in those days, almost epochal, a move from tribes to nations. And in the midst of that fast change, Saul became overwhelmed, constricted, angry, and afraid. You know, it's interesting, on Tuesday night, I asked the session, what do you all need to hear? You know, the session is really my partners. They're my partners in ministry here. So I wanted to ask, well, well, what does the congregation need to hear these days? And one of the elders says, we, we need to have a sense of how to live in a fast-changing world. What does it mean to be a Christian as we live in this fast-changing world? And I... I think that this passage has something to say because the pace of change was certainly there at that time, but the pace of change is definitely here in our time. In fact, it's, it's so extraordinary how fast things are going that, that it's shifting what I'd call the tectonic plates of culture. You know, it's shaken us at our foundation and our roots. You know, we have, uh, have an opportunity each time we open the newspaper to find out there's been a new eruption or a new cavitation of these plates. Big tech has come up and taken over. It had such a glorious vision when it first started, you know? Glorious vision of giving everybody a voice and the truth somehow emerging if everybody had a chance to talk and, and share what, what was important to them. We apparently weren't ready for that. 
We haven't been educated in how to use that. And instead, that vision has been distorted so that anything but truth is what's emerging in our culture. That's part of the eruption of the anger that happens everywhere we look. Then there are all the hot spots. At any moment in this fast changing world, Taiwan could explode, India, Pakistan could explode, North Korea could decide that it really is uh, willing to commit suicide. It's distressing to say the least. And then we're fighting this battle for freedom and democracy. Did anybody think we were going to have to fight that battle in 2022? It's kind of a shock. So much change, so fast. People are afraid and the stresses and the strains in the human life make it very difficult to know what's going to come at us next. When's the next jihad going to come at us? It's not like Everybody's forgotten about those commitments in the world. <laughs> and if isn't, that isn't enough, then we're trying to deal with a pandemic. And I have a feeling that there's greater anxiety around this pandemic than just about COVID. I mean, we just found out how vulnerable we are to disease in a very practical way. And it, it raises the tension and the anxiety all over the world where we need to work together, but we found out we can do anything but. And then there's the impact of climate change. Never, never mind whether we should stop, you know, uh, stop pouring stuff into the air so that climate change doesn't happen. We're feeling the impacts of it now every year. And it can be pretty overwhelming. So it's not surprising that we see just in everyday life, things just kind of falling apart. There's signs everywhere, road rage is up. You know, you read about all the arrests on airplane and now we have a boxer punching somebody out because he was mean to him on an airplane and give me a break. We have that going on. It just seems to reflect that we have three mass shootings in the US over Easter weekend. I, I read a story the other day in my Apple news feed that there's a woman who is a referee for a girls under 12 softball game. And one of the moms objected to one of her calls. And so the mom punched the referee. I mean, what's the matter with these people? That really is the question. What's the matter with us? Because all of us react one way or another to tension. Hopefully we're not punching out referees at girls' soccer games. Teen suicide. I mean, I think that's the bellwether, you know? It's up 60%. Did anybody see the article in the Times this morning? I read it at about 4 a.m. and it had to make it into the sermon. Teen suicide up 60% from 2007. And what that tells us is the stresses and strains on our young people as they try and look to future. They're feeling helpless and overwhelmed. Likely to go find a medium somewhere and figure out whether they can hold an answer. It's not an easy time. We are going through these extraordinary changes. So what does the passage have to say to us? Well, Saul found Samuel, the epitome, the absolute epitome of the old way of doing things. When we had tribes, and as tribes would gather together and try and hold little pieces of land, they might have some conflict. But the tribes were lost when a group of tribes, a nation that could identify itself and have a single goal showed up because they could overwhelm a group of tribes. And so now there was an effort. It, it's a move from tribalism to nationhood. In order to survive, you've got to move to nationhood. Right? All of our ancestors, in one way or another, had to have moved to nationhood because the tribal thing didn't work out. And, and this was the moment of epochal change that was taking place. That's what's being described here. And Saul failed. 
because he couldn't quite get it together to pull a nation together that had an identity that could do what it needed to do and resist the Philistine advance. He had failed. But all the while, God was preparing another leader. God was tilling the soil of the people and preparing a leader that did have the capacity to join all of the tribes of Israel together in a single vision with a purpose and a destiny. He galvanized them around an idea. And the idea that they get, got was they were all descendants of Abraham. And Abraham had received a promise from God that all of Abraham's descendants would be able to reflect and bless the whole world with God's love and strength. David pictured a nation that could show the world how to live with a God whose very nature is loving. You know, it was during David's reign that the first layer of Torah was edited and compiled and pulled together. During David's reign is when this happened. And the Bible was drawn together at that moment to give the nation a sense of identity and purpose. We're, we're here to put ourselves in right relationship to the presence of the divine so that it can then overflow in the way we treat one another. That's the vision that David had for this nation that would pull together. We're at a moment of epochal change too. We really are. It was a pretty big moment in human history, moving from tribes to nations. But at this point, the world has become so small that there's some question as to whether we can remain stable in a world where it's all about nas national identity and national selfishness. And we're seeing what happens when an epochal change is gonna come. All the elements are there. The pace of change is placing stress on all of our systems. It's placing stress on the economic systems all over the world. We're seeing things shaken up right now. Things are gonna get worse before they get better. It's shaken up the political realm. I mean, we never dreamed that we would be fighting this war that the Ukrainians would have to fight this war at this moment. Huge political change on the world stage and religious change. It's as though religion has faded into the background for most of the world. It's like the powers that be aren't thinking in terms of their purpose or what God would seek them to do. We seem to be arriving at a moment that scientists call punctuated equilibrium. You know, things change so fast that there's a big shift and society becomes reordered. When's it gonna happen? Are we at the beginning of that kind of shift or at the end of it? I have no idea. But what I do know is what God's about in the midst of it as things get shaken up, as those changes are ready to happen. I do know what God's about because God is busy tilling the soil, preparing us for change, training up leaders, people that can speak and have vision. And you and I are part of that project. I don't know what each of our roles will be, but you and I get to look forward and see where God might be leading. And we've got a real clue as to the direction it might go. It will always have to do with loving God being absorbed into God's purpose so that it overflows and cares for the people around us. And it will require us to let go of the things we think always worked. That's the way things unfold in creation. So we're looking for leaders that can focus on God's purpose as the purpose for our lives. 
And that's going to require us not to be stuck in the old, and that means we're going to have to be self-critical. Now, you know, I've made it clear enough that I'm a fairly liberal person politically. <laughs> Disgust. <laughs> I work pretty hard, and I think I have to, to be self-critical of what I would call the blue bubble, you know, to recognize that eh, there's some real questions here. You know, self-righteousness from that point of view is not going to help us. That's going to put us into continuing conflict. And the same is true of the right. We have to be self-critical. Because right now, we're heading towards system failure instead of having things be rebuilt. So if we're looking for God's direction and God's purpose, we're knowing that the next beautiful thing that God will bring about will be an increase in harmony between us, not an increase of destruction. That's the challenge. We've got to look beyond the conflicts we live in. Because until we do, we won't find the path forward to a more beautiful place. All through the scriptures, we can see God working this way. Anytime there's a trap, anytime the systems start to break down and crash, we find that God's been working somehow, raising up leaders. The story of Moses, as the people were completely enslaved. The story of, of the moment that the Israelite people were freed from captivity in Babylon and sent home by the Persians. These are, are moments where God's been working in history. The moment when when Jesus came and, and helped to redefine the Jewish religion so that it could more clearly focus on God's purpose as the Roman Empire grew and grew and grew. And then there's us. Waiting on the power of God to be expressed through us so that we can be an impact in this time of extraordinary change. We do not have to live out of fear because we worship a God that will take the destruction and the tension of this moment and bring about something surprising and new and beautiful in the next. That's our joy, that's our hope. So how do we live at a time of fast-paced change? We remain centered on the purposes of God, and that will require us to be self-critical because our society is focused on anything but. And as we remain focused on those purposes, we will find that hope will emerge within us because our God wants us to grow and become perfect and is looking for all of you and me to be agents of that creative process. Amen.